uh, good to see everyone here. It's rare that we actually get all our congregations uh, together from across Grace Point, so it's great to see all of you this morning. Uh, you might want to have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy. We will look at, at a couple of these passages. Uh, there is a sermon outline as well in your order of services, and you might want to pull that out because that will actually help you follow along as we uh, look at what the Bible actually says this Lord's Day. Let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we do thank you that you reveal yourself and that you speak it in true your word. Uh, we do pray and ask that uh, as we gather as three congregations uh, under one roof, under your word, around the Lord Jesus, we do pray, Father, that your spirit might bring our lives under conviction and that you might continue to guide and lead and shape us as a church community uh, for the glory of the Lord Jesus and our everlasting joy and security in him. Uh, so bless our time, strengthen us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've uh, talked to Pastor Elliot, and as I've reflected on conversations with quite a number of you, I've, I've asked myself, uh, what's the biggest challenge we face as a church, and what do we need going into 2024? I mean, every year we do a Vision Sunday, which is basically casting a vision for where we want to go each year as a church community, and we do a lot of that based on our needs. Uh, what do we most need? What are the challenges we face? Is it rising hostility because uh, culture has become more secular? Uh, is it financial pressure uh, that quite a number of us feel? Is it the rise of anxiety and depression, which is actually on the rise, more so in this generation than any other generation? Uh, is it busyness and lack of time, which I hear from many of you? Is it exhaustion and tiredness because uh, for many of you, as you get older, uh, you have greater responsibilities, and so you're busy and you're tired. Uh, I'm sure those are all real challenges, but it's worth asking, isn't it? And, and what I want to do this Sunday, as we, as we think of 2024, is pause and take a step back and ask ourselves, what is the biggest challenge we face as a church? Now, the answer might actually surprise you. I think it's actually discontentment, which is why if you've got your outline, I've got a little quote there from the Gospel Coalition. Notice what it says. Discontentment may be the greatest trap in our culture. It may be greater than lust, greed, and even lying because discontentment leads to all these other sins. It tends to be the wellspring, the fountain of iniquity. I have yet to meet an individual who engaged in an affair without first suffering from discontentment. I have yet to speak with a drunkard, a gossiper, a liar, or idolater of body uh, or rest or recreation without them alluding to discontentment. And it feels like the entire world is colluding to stir up discontentment within us. Every billboard, every commercial, every brochure, I would add to that, uh, everything that we read, see, fill our lives with on blogs and podcasts and on the internet tends to communicate, you deserve and you need more. You deserve and you need more. Uh, and I think the lie that you deserve and need more is more alive and act active in the church, in your life and in my life, more than we actually would care to admit. <clears throat> Contentment is very, very hard to come by these days. To be satisfied and happy with what you have, your money, your possessions, uh, to be satisfied and happy with your work, uh, to be satisfied and happy in your marriage, uh, to be satisfied and happy in your singleness, to be satisfied and happy in your studies, to be happy and satisfied with your church community. Uh, it's a struggle to be content in life. Uh, in fact, most of my time spent with people uh, is really dealing with discontentment. I don't think they see it like that, but it's certainly true. It's mainly dealing with discontentment. And what makes it worse is that you and I, we live in a culture that feels discontentment in our lives. The marketing industry is built on creating a culture of dissatisfaction in your life and my life. Sorry, those of you who work in marketing. I know there's quite a number of people here. Because the marketing industry feeds us the lie that we are lacking, that we deserve better. 
and we, and, and we always need more to be content and secure and happy. We need bigger and better and newer because what we have is insufficient. And so we buy more, we upgrade, we invest, we expand, we enlarge. And Christian people are not immune with the onslaught of being told that you deserve more. And so you feel like you're missing out as you compare yourself to others. As you look at your children, you look at, the children, at other people's children. You feel like you need more stuff to be happy. You need more experiences to be happy. You, need, you feel that you need uh, a, a particular kind of relationship to be satisfied. You feel that you need to have everything catered for you in a church community. Why? Because you think you deserve it. Uh, and so, you know, you don't have to look outside the church to find discontentment because it's alive in a church community. And so people actually live one of three ways. And maybe this is you this morning. Some of us, we live in fear. And so we hold on very tightly to everything we possess, everything we own, because we are so afraid of losing what we have, our money, our career. Another group, some of us, we live in resentment. Uh, we are resentful and we are always grumbling and we are demanding because we are always struggling to get what we think we don't have, that we think we should have money and career and friendship. But there's another group, and they are the dissatisfied. So some of us are dissatisfied even with what we have. And so we just want more, and so we are greedy. We live our lives grabbing at things, more, bigger career, better social network, more money. And so the discontent live in either perpetual fear, resentment and grumbling, or greed. See, three things, fear, resentment, or greed. It's a terrible way to live, whether you are a Christian person or not, right? Afraid of losing what you do have, resentful because you don't have something, or greedy, wanting more. And so you take a step back, and it's worth asking in your life and in my life, which one are you, okay? Now, here in 1 Timothy 6, if you have your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, is Paul's antidote, right? He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I want to say to you that uh, as we move into next year, this is the pill you want to take daily. This is the antidote, and this is what I think we most need as a church. Uh, you know, some of you I know in this room, right, you take probiotics each day, or maybe you take multivitamins for the over 50s, or maybe you take fish oil tablets because you lift and you want your joint, right, you want quick recovery. Why do you do that? Well, you do it because it's meant to help your health, right? Well, this is the antidote to discontentment, the sin that actually... Uh, what I would call dogs our generation. Paul says, what is going to give you great gain in life, what is going to bring you most profit in life is actually godliness. And this is why uh, you read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it's godliness with contentment that is great gain. It's godliness with contentment that's going to give you the biggest return on investment in life. Notice what Paul does not say. So think with me for a moment. What does Paul not say? Okay. Paul does not say, having all your children's academic needs met with contentment is great gain. Uh, he doesn't say, a well-managed super fund with contentment is great gain. He doesn't say, having all my emotional needs met with contentment is great gain. He doesn't say, a pain-free life with contentment is great gain. He doesn't say that, does he? What does Paul say in verse 6? He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. You see there? Now, why does Paul say that? Why is it godliness with contentment that's great gain? Well, the answer is actually found. You move a couple of chapters back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And so move a couple of chapters back, chapter 3, verse 16, and he says, if you know true godliness, you'll see and understand and grasp its value, uh, its worth, its riches. If you've understood true godliness, you'll see it is more valuable than anything you possess in your life right now. It's more valuable than any investment you're considering right now, which you'll see it's more satisfying than any relationship that you are looking for or relying on right now. You see that it's more comforting than anything you're trying to find your comfort and security in. Because if you saw the value and riches of true godliness, you would run after it. You would be hungry for it. Now, I think the reverse is true for the majority of us. Because most Christians have no desire for godliness. I think most of us have no desire for godliness because we are blind to its actual worth, its value, its riches, its comfort, its security, the power and love that it can give us. But we all want to be content, don't we, in life, right? That everyone in this room, we all want to be content in life, which is why all of us, 
all of us, we live our lives in the pursuit of things that we think are powerful enough and great enough to give it to us, right? Everyone. So we, we live our lives sometimes, you know, pursuing things we believe are valuable and rich enough to satisfy us. Things we believe are rich enough to quench our hunger for comfort and security and power and love. And so, some of us, we make career our pursuit. Some of us, we make financial security our pursuit. Some of us, we make social standing our pursuit. Some of us, we make our children's achievements our pursuit. Some of us, we make relational success our pursuits. Why? Because we want to be content and satisfied in life. And the reason why we don't pursue godliness is because we don't think it's valuable enough. It can't give it to us. It's, it's the last place we look to find contentment in our lives. Isn't that true? Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you thought in your moment of fear because of financial stress, or maybe in your moment of fear because of some sickness or tragedy that has overwhelmed you, when have you thought in those moments, you know what, I need to pursue godliness because godliness with contentment is great gain. We don't think like that, do we? When was the last time you thought in your disappointment in your marriage, in your dissatisfaction at work, in your difficult circumstances, in your unmet emotional needs and anxiety, in your hurts and grief that you've experienced from other people, in your resentment because you feel stuck where you are in life and life just hasn't panned out. When have you thought in those moments, you know what? I need to pursue godliness in those situations because godliness with contentment is great gain. How many of us actually do that? Very few of us do that. I don't. But Paul says, for the Christian... It's godliness with contentment that is great gain. Now, here's the reason why 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, if you've understood the true riches of godliness, you'll see why it's godliness with contentment that's great gain and not anything else in your life. Look at what Paul says, 1 Timothy 3, 16. The mystery from which true godliness springs is great. The word there is mega, right? Uh, the, the mystery from which true godliness springs is mega, it's of great magnitude. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Notice that true godliness is not found in any material wealth or possession. It's not found in your career. It's not found in religion or ritual, which is why later, if you read the tail end of chapter 6, which was read for us, the end of chapter 6 reminds us that wealth creation actually has nothing to do with the pursuit of godliness. Did you hear that? Wealth creation has got nothing to do with the pursuit of godliness. He doesn't say Christian people can't be rich, but he will say that wealth creation actually has nothing to do with the pursuit of godliness. But wealth can be a means to give expression to your godliness in giving it away. In giving it away in the service of others. Right? So he can express godliness. Now, I want you to notice that true godliness is not found in something you do. It's not found in law-keeping or good works or your morality. It's not found in what we do. Look at verse 18. The mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Where do we find true godliness? It's not rocket science, isn't it? True godliness that brings contentment is revealed in a person. It's revealed in a person. And we know in this letter that he's speaking about Jesus. These verses are a summary of the life of Jesus. He's saving work. He is the mystery hidden now revealed. He is the treasure now hidden, now made available, now uncovered in his greatness, in its magnitude, in its meganess. Jesus is the one which, from which true godliness overflows and springs, which means that He is the source of the riches and the wealth and the comfort and the security and the power and the love that you are so looking for in life. Because what do we see in the Lord Jesus? We see God become man. We see the creator of every source of comfort and security and power and love enter our world. We see the kingdom of heaven breaking in our world. What does Jesus come to do? He comes to heal, to restore. He comes to push back brokenness, pain, and suffering, and death. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus. We actually see the riches of heaven walk with us. 
we see unfailing comfort and love come to pursue us all the way to the cross. We are and we will always be loved, whatever the circumstances in our lives. We see unmatched power and security on display for us in His power over death, in His resurrection. He rules over everything. In life, we need never be afraid, whatever our circumstances. He appeared in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He died. He rose to save us from the power of sin and death. You see, the fountain of true godliness in all its greatness and magnitude overflows and floods us with the eternal riches of God, and it comes to us in the Lord Jesus. That's why godliness alone with contentment is great gain. Do you believe that? Nothing will ever satisfy you in life more than true godliness. In the God who came and died for you and rose over death, who was proclaimed and believed and who now rules in glory, God, the source of all comfort and security and power and love, has come for you. And that's why when you read the life of Jesus, what is Jesus doing? Notice, when you read the life of Jesus, He comes to heal the sick, the hungry are fed, the lonely are welcome, the rejected are accepted, the spiritually afflicted they are made whole, the guilty are forgiven, the dead are raised. <laughs> what you and I are meant to see is that the king of the kingdom of heaven has invaded earth. And he doesn't just invade earth, he brings with him the riches of heaven. Notice that that's what's happening every time the gospel is being made known and proclaimed and shared. It's flooding the world, and it's changing lives with the riches of heaven in the personal work of Jesus. Many of you know your Bibles. You know 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, right? 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus, that though He was rich for your sakes, He became poor, so that you, through His poverty, might become rich. How does that happen? Well, He was rich. He possessed the throne of heaven. He holds it in His hand eternal comfort, security, power, and love. But he became poor. How, why did he become poor? Because he gave it up and he gave it to you. He embraced the cross, your cross, death in our place for our sins, our rebellion, so that through his poverty we might know the riches of heaven, lasting comfort, security, power, and love that never ends. You know, that's why when you turn to the Gospels and in the epistles, Jesus is always held up as supremely glorious. The greater your vision of the Lord Jesus, the more you find your sufficiency met in Him. And I think our problem is that we just don't have a very big picture of Jesus in our lives. But when you turn to the Gospels and the Epistles, we're told many things, but one of the things we're told is His supremacy, His greatness, His beauty is highlighted for us. He is the highest treasure. He's the pearl of great price that you sell everything for to get. Matthew 13. He's the hidden treasure in the field that if you find, you're prepared to liquidate everything you have in life so you can possess it. He is the yoke that gives rest for your souls, Matthew 11. He's the rock that withstands every and any flood, Matthew 7. He's the bread of life that will fill your hunger, giving you life forever, John 6. He's the living water that quenches your every thirst in life, John 14. He's the light of the world that shines in the darkness that can never be put out, John 8. He's the resurrection and the life, John 11, verse 25. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He loves you eternally. He's the lamb who's slain for our sin, John 1. He's our peace that reconciles people people to each other and to God, Ephesians 2. He is the one in whom are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in life, Colossians 2. He is the infinite power of God, 1 Corinthians 1. He is the beginning and the end who calls the keys to life and death, Revelation 1. He is the line of Judah who has conquered all, Revelation 5. He is the shepherd who guides us to living waters, Revelation 7. He is the divine warrior who fights for you and conquers every enemy, Revelation 19. On and on the Bible goes. It's the Bible's way of saying, Jesus is everything you will ever need in life, even if you lost everything today. And He is everything that will satisfy you. Do you believe that? True godliness, in all His greatness and magnitude, comfort, security, power, and love, according to Paul, is found in nothing less than Jesus and His work for us. Now, if this is true, right, let's assume it's true, okay? Because we know it here, but I don't think we always know it here. But let's assume it's true. If that's true, Christian people are the richest people in the world. You would be the richest people in the world today if you truly believed it because you possess something more valuable, more secure, more, more satisfying than your earthly possessions. Jesus himself said, 
that the kingdom he has secured for us is a treasure of such value that you would liquidate everything for in your life to possess it if you saw its value, the pearl of great price. Now, I suspect most of us have never grasped this great reality because in our hearts and minds, right, this is what we think. Financial security with contentment is a great gain. A larger investment portfolio with contentment is a great gain, right? Uh, having a certain lifestyle with contentment is a great gain. Getting this job with contentment is a great gain. Having this relationship with contentment is a great gain. Having a particular academic future with contentment is a great gain. That's how most of us think. No, no, no. Paul says this godliness with contentment is a great gain because true godliness that's found in Jesus have, has, has given you far greater wealth, far greater security, far greater comfort, and far greater love and power. True godliness that's found in Jesus has given you riches that should actually change your life, it should change the way you live, your pursuits, and it should also change the way you look at your life and your possessions today. Because notice what happens if you've really understood what Jesus gives you. If you've understood true godliness and the riches Jesus has given you, it means everything you own and possess right now, every earthly pursuit you are engaged in right now, should look like a monopoly board. Monopoly money. Monopoly pursuits. Monopoly property. And monopoly ambitions in life in light of the riches Jesus has given you, <coughs> right? Now, if that's true, you should no longer be afraid of losing stuff in life. You should no longer be despairing because you don't have the stuff that you think you should have. And, and you shouldn't actually be greedily trying to acquire stuff because its worth has just dropped. Its value has just dropped in light of the riches you now have in Jesus. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm not looking at it today, but Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 32 to verse 35 gives, gives us an actual practical example, a pastoral situation of what happens when this becomes a reality for Christians. Because, you know, there's, there's people who say, oh, I can't do that huge. Well, the New Testament gives us examples. And so in Hebrews 10, verse 32 to verse 35, you got a bunch of Christian people, and this is how they responded when they lost stuff. Uh, they're suffering because they've been unjustly treated. In fact, they've lost their possessions. <coughs> in fact, their expectations weren't met. And you discover even in their losses, there's joy. There's joy. Joy is possible even in loss. How is it possible? I'm going to read verse 32 to verse 35, Hebrews 10 for us. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you became Christians, when you endured in, in a great conflict full of suffering, Sometimes you were publicly exposed or insult to insults and persecution, and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison, and notice it says, and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. Now, how, how is joy possible? How is contentment possible when you don't have stuff, or you feel you are losing stuff. Well, verse 34 says they knew they had something more valuable. They already had it. It was in their possession. They had better and lasting possessions, greater riches and wealth in the gospel, in true godliness. You see, Christian people who have understood Jesus rightly actually have a very loose grip on their earthly pursuits and possessions in life. Did you hear that? A very, very loose grip. They don't have a tight grip on their personal ambitions, and pursuits in life. <coughs> they, they don't have a compulsion to hold on tightly to things in life. And here's the reason why. Because you've come to the realization that you cannot lose anything earthly worth more than what has been secured for you eternally. You can't lose anything earthly worth more than the riches Jesus has secured and given to you. Let me say this bluntly. <coughs> the reason why so many of us are dissatisfied and discontent in life is because we're looking for contentment in the wrong places and the wrong things. And the reason why so many of, of us are never thankful, grumbling and complaining about what we don't have in life 
is because we're looking for contentment in the wrong places. And the reason why we're always comparing ourselves with others and feeling like we don't have enough is because you're looking for contentment in the wrong places. And the reason why you're discontent and you're always chasing after stuff is because you're looking for contentment in the wrong places. So it's no surprise we now read what we read. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says, <coughs> train yourself. Train yourself in wealth creation. No. Train yourself so that you have better study skills and relationship skills. No. He says, train yourself, notice in what? Godliness. Church, train yourself in godliness. If godliness in Jesus is of greater worth and value than any other pursuit in your life, we shouldn't be surprised what we read here. If godliness in Jesus has secured for me the riches of heaven, comfort that's lasting, security that's guaranteed, power unmatched, love that's unfailing, then we shouldn't be surprised by what we read here. Having told us where true godliness is found, he says, train yourself in godliness. You see there, verse 7, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I know for a fact everyone in this room is training for something or has trained for something. Some of you recently trained for the half marathon, right? Some of you train to be better as musicians. Some of you do train academically with your tutoring. Some of you <coughs> in real estate and property investment. Some of you with your art. Some of you with your sports. Some of you to improve your health. Some of you do to lose weight. You want to ride faster. Some of you. Everyone here is training for something in their lives, and we train in or for these things because we believe they are great enough to give us the contentment we're looking for, the riches we're looking for, the comfort and the security and the power and, the, and love that we're looking for. Notice, for those of you who are runners, okay, so uh, <clears throat> some of you in this room are runners. I noticed that, you know, if, you, if you're a runner and you train for a run, notice when you finish the run, what do you experience? Satisfaction. There is satisfaction. There is contentment, isn't there? And, and Paul is saying it's the same with godliness, but it has value not just in the present, but into eternity. Notice what he says. Physical training is of some value, verse 10, verse 8, but, but, for, but physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things in the present and the future. Physical training has some value now. A everything that you are pursuing in your life right now has some value. I want you to understand that. Exercise is, is of some value. Tutoring is of some value. Your relationship, your marriage, your kids' academic and sporting achievements is of some value. Property investment that you're making is of some value. And it will give you a measure of contentment and security and power and happiness in life. It will. It's a good thing. It's a gift from God. But it's limited. That's why another version of the Bible puts it like this. Physical training has limited value, limited benefits. Now, the contrast comes in verse 8, you see. But godliness in Jesus has greater value. Why? It can do more. It gives you more, right? Physical training is limited to this life and this world. Whatever gain you get through physical training, we all know comes to an end, doesn't it? Any profit you make in physical training has a use-by date. Anything you think will give you contentment here in the now has a use-by date. You need to pause and let that sink in. Your wealth, your property, your career success, your relationship, your children's achievements, even marriage has a use by date. Jesus says, subject to decay and death and very, very easily taken from us. And we put a far too big premium on these things. But notice godliness in Jesus has eternal significance. It holds promise for the present and the future. It can give you comfort in the present and in the future. It can give you love in the present and the future, love that never ends and fails. It can give you security in the present and future, power and security that's unmatched and absolute control. It has value in the present and the future. And so physical training, right, it can, it can slow down the aging process, but it cannot stop it. Physical training can sculpt you aesthetically to look like a Greek god. But guess what? It won't stop the onslaught of muscle de degeneration that comes with age, right? So I know Will, right? Looks like a Greek god today, right? I'm talking about Will Chen, okay? Sculpted, or Jason over there, even bigger, 
right? Sculpted. He's the biggest guy in the room, by the way. Okay. Physical training can increase your endurance and explosive power as a runner, as an athlete, but it won't stop you slowing down in time. And so it has limited gain. And I want to say to you, whatever benefit you're pursuing in your life right now, whatever earthly pursuit that you're pursuing, it will come to an end. So everything you are pursuing and training for in life right now is limited. It can only give you limited comfort, limited security, limited power, and limited love. But godliness in Jesus, Paul says, holds promise, value, worth, riches, greatness for life in the present and in the life to come. Now, let's take a step back and pause. Think about, if this were true, how would it change your life knowing that because of Jesus, you are the richest people in the world right now? Because of Jesus, you have riches of an eternal kingdom, comfort that's lasting, security that's guaranteed, power that is unmatched, and love that's unfailing. How would it change your life knowing that godliness in Jesus has secured for you riches that has made everything you own and possess in your life right now nothing more than monopoly money, monopoly pursuits, monopoly ambitions, fun and enjoyable, limited in their use. I think if we really understood the truth of that gospel truth, many of us here, would, we would live with less fear about losing things in life. We would be less resentful and grumbling and unthankful we would be more thankful and content, wouldn't we? Some of us would stop grumbling and complaining about what we have in God. Some of us would stop comparing with others. Some of us would live with much greater confidence and generosity. We wouldn't hoard. We'd use what we have to serve others. Some of us would be less anxious about losing out. Some of us would be less materialistic. Some of us would be no longer greedy. Some of us would worry less about the future because of what we already possess. And some of us would live with greater simplicity. And some of us would live with greater sacrifice in the service of the gospel and others because we have come to the realization that we lose nothing because we already have everything. And you know what? Some of us would be thankful and filled with joy even in life's most difficult circumstances because we possess riches, comfort, power and love unsurpassing. You see, godliness in Jesus and the riches He has secured for us holds promise for the present life and the life to come. It, if you understood that, it would free you today from fear, resentment, and greed. And then it would empower you to live like you've never lived before, with generous generosity and sacrificial uh, and sacrificially in the service of others in the gospel. That's why Paul says, train yourself in godliness. Pursue Jesus. Walk with Him. Listen to Him. Follow Him. Grow in your knowledge of His great work to grasp the riches of His promises. Commit to giving expression to live under His rule if you truly believe that He is the source of everything you desire. Follow Him. Listen to His words. Live under His kingdom rule. That will free you up from a life of fear, resentment, and greed. Knowing Him will empower you to live in incredibly different ways. Immerse yourself in the riches of this person as you would any other relationship. A child runs to dad because they believe he can give them comfort when they hurt themselves. The sick run to the doctor believing she has the cure. The student runs to their tutor believing they can help. The Apple user runs to the genius bar when they can't work out what's wrong. But nothing ever goes wrong with apples. <laughs> Where does the Christian man or woman go? The Christian man or woman always runs to the fountain of true godliness. To Jesus, whose riches is able to give them lasting comfort, security, power, and love in their daily lives. Listen very carefully, church. Your number one priority as a Christian in life, is your relationship with Jesus. Did you hear that? Your number one priority in life as a Christian is your relationship with Jesus. Knowing Him, listening to Him, following His lead, growing to love Him and become more like Him. To have Him fill 
the horizon of your life. Now, you know, I cannot do that for you. Your CG leader cannot do that for you. We can help you, we can resource you, we can teach you the Bible, we can equip you. But you need to take responsibility for the pursuit of godliness in your own life. You need to take the responsibility to train for godliness in your life. You know, the, the church is really like a gym, you know that? The church is really like a gym. Lots of people take up membership, but they never work out. That's true, right? It's true. The church is like a gym. Lots of people take up membership, but they never work out. Some come when it's convenient. Some never turn up. And at home, what do they do? Binge on Netflix and chips. They fill their lives with everything but the Lord Jesus. It's true. Maybe once a month they show up, they never train. And then, guess what? They blame the gym because they don't see results in their lives. It's true. Ah, lousy gym. Hasn't helped me. Well, if you're a grace point and you're not growing, if you're a grace point and you're unhappy, you're dissatisfied, you're disconnected, and you look at your life and you go, oh, there's no change in my life. There's no joy in my life. There's no impact in my life. Can I actually say, it is very, very, very unlikely that we are the problem. I actually think you are the problem. I know people hate hearing that because it's just not PC to say things like that. Our vision for the year ahead is just for us to get back to the basics. Just get back to the basics in your life, to pursue what is foundational in the Christian life, to pursue godliness to run after Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to know Him, to hear His voice, and to follow His lead. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. You know, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says this is the goal of all that he does, his service to the gospel, and his goal, he says, is to present everyone mature in Christ. That's Paul's priority, but that should be our priority as well. Your number one goal in relationship in life is to become more like Jesus. How does it happen? It's not rocket science, by the way. <clears throat> this is how it happens. This is how you pursue true godliness. If you have your Bibles, have a look at Colossians 2, verse 6 to verse 7. Colossians 2, verse 6 to verse 7. Paul then says, So then, just as you have received Christ as Lord, here it is, Continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him. Strengthen in the faith as you were taught and overflowing at thankfulness. You see there? You just want to walk with Jesus. You want to hear His voice. <clears throat> you want to listen to Him and you want to follow after Him. That's the secret to the Christian life. That is the secret to the happy Christian life. That one's worth writing down, you know. What is the secret to the happy life, the good life, the satisfied life, the comfortable life, the secure life, the powerful life, the loving life? Is to walk with Jesus. You know the hymn? To be happy is to walk with Jesus. I know most of you don't know the hymn. That's okay. <laughs> to be happy. No. <laughs> and notice how Colossians 2 verse 6 to 7 ends. It says what? Overflowing with thankfulness. You see there? It's strange, isn't it? Paul says, immerse yourself in the Lord Jesus, walk with Jesus, listen to Him, and then he says, overflowing in thankfulness. Why? Because thankfulness is the fruit of contentment. Grumbling and complaining is the fruit of discontentment. Thankfulness is the fruit of contentment in Jesus. And that's why, you know, I look at church these days, right? I've been here a long time. <clears throat> There's no point trying to do big things when you can't even do the most basic thing. Did you hear that? No point trying to do big things when you can't even get the basic things right. Trying to do a 10-kilometer run when you don't even run. Trying to paint a masterpiece when you can't even draw. <laughs> and so what we want to do is we want to be a church that gets the foundations right. And that is to be a people who are personally walking with Jesus, knowing Him, listening to Him, following His lead. And that means as we move into next year, we want to invest in two things. We want you to invest in two things your personal walk with Jesus, your personal Bible reading and prayer life. That is key. 
your personal walk with Jesus, your personal Bible reading and prayer life, that is key, right? If you want to know the magic bullet, that's the magic bullet, okay? But there's a second thing, your personal walk with the people around you, around the Lord Jesus, your personal walk with each other around the Lord Jesus, committing to worship in life together around word and prayer, committing to worship in life together around the Lord Jesus. God has given us the means of grace to experience and to enjoy deep contentment, deep security and love and comfort and power. And it's found in something that will never fail us, personal time in word and prayer, worship and community are but a few. And I'm telling you this, you neglect these things to your peril. People who drift away from Jesus actually start here. It begins from a place of neglect in the basics. People who have shipwrecked their faith the last 25 years here at Grace Point begin here. And I can confidently say you won't be a follower of Jesus a decade from now if you're not resolving to walk with Jesus and others around here with you around word and prayer in your life. I can confidently say that. Now, if true godliness in Jesus has given you everything, it now means everything in your life is like a monopoly game, is monopoly money, monopoly ambitions and pursuits. It gives you limited comfort. But it also means that if we have come to know true godliness in Jesus in our lives, then we should be content. So come back to chapter 6, verse 6. Right? Paul writes, Godliness with contentment is great gain for the Christian. Right? The godly are marked by contentment because they've understood. They've understood and grasped the mystery of true godliness in Jesus. They know the worth and value of everything in the Lord Jesus. They know it's now theirs, right? And so, if you want to know someone or what marks godliness, well, here it is. Godly people are actually marked by contentment because they know how rich they are in the Lord Jesus. You want to know if you're godly? Well, here it is. Here's another way of putting it. True godliness for the Christian is marked by contentment because they know they have everything in Jesus. And that means they realize everything they possess in their lives, every pursuit is now monopoly money, monopoly property, monopoly ambition, monopoly pursuits. That's the mark of true godliness. Contentment and a very, uh, no longer a tight grip on things in life, a loose grip on things in life. That's a mark of godliness. Now, what does it mean for us? I'm going to uh, draw three points of application, right? Here's number one. Some of us do need to repent because we're actually ungodly. We're not content. That's why in place of true godliness and finding our contentment in Jesus and His riches, we pursue monopoly money, monopoly pursuits, monopoly ambitions in life. For some of you, it's money and contentment. That's great gain. So that's your pursuit. For some of you, it's your kids' achievements. That's your... That with contentment, that's great gain. So that's your pursuit. For so some of you, it's having a relationship with contentment, that's great gain. That's your pursuit, right? For some of you, it's traveling with contentment. That's great gain. That's your pursuit in life. And, and, and we pursue many things, right? Paul says it's godliness with contentment for the Christian man or woman that's great gain. Now, that actually tells me if we make anything else in life our pursuit to find ultimate contentment, and comfort and security and power and love in life, if we make anything else ultimate, it means we are ungodly. It means you are ungodly because that's how the Bible defines it. Putting and looking to find your riches, your comfort, your security, your power and your love in anything other than Jesus is ungodliness. Repent. That's ungodliness. There's actually nothing Christian about it. Now, if you think about it, to an extent, all of us need to repent, don't we? Because all of us fail to pursue true godliness in the riches of the Lord Jesus. We all do. And maybe that's something we all need to do this morning. And repentance actually starts with confession. Acknowledging that before God, that in your struggle with contentment, you've run to find your Contentment met in all these other places. You've replaced Jesus with something else in your life, something ungodly. And that is something we must repent and reject of this morning. Now, some of us also need to repent this morning because we, we are actually ungodly. We're not content. And that's why we're always complaining and grumbling. 
we are demanding. We think we deserve more. We deserve better. We are owed something. And so we are always demanding of people, of circumstances, of relationships. We overflow with complaints, and we're never grateful. Paul says it's ungodliness. It's godliness with contentment for the Christian man or woman that's great gain. Which means if you look at your life and there is a, if there is a demanding spirit, a posture of ungratefulness, a pattern of complaining, it's actually a mark of ungodliness. It says, I am not content with what God has given me in my life. The gospel is not enough. That's what it's saying. It's saying Jesus is not good enough. It's saying the riches and the comfort and the security and the power and love God has given me in Jesus is insufficient in my life. I deserve more. I deserve better. That's ungodliness. Repent. There's nothing Christian about it. And to to an extent, all of us need to repent, don't we? Because we're always complaining and grumbling. We think we deserve more. We think we deserve better. We are owed something. And we are very demanding in our relationships. Maybe that's something we all need to do this morning. And repentance actually starts with confession. Confession. Acknowledging before God that in your complaining and grumbling, you are an ungrateful person. You have not been thankful for the riches and the comfort and security and love and power that God has given you in the Lord Jesus. But there's a third thing, and I think all of us also need to resolve this morning to make the pursuit of Jesus our priority in life. To make the basic thing the basic thing, your basic thing. And that means committing to making the main thing the main thing in your life, in my life. Walking with Jesus, knowing Him, listening to Him, following His lead, letting Him fill the foundation of your life. We want to be a church that has the foundations right. Next year is a year of foundations, by the way. We want to get the foundations right. Okay? And that means committing to be a people who are personally walking with Jesus, listening to Him, following His lead. And so we we really want you to only invest in two things as we move into next year. And it doesn't start next year, by the way. It starts today. We want you to invest in your personal walk with Jesus, your personal Bible reading and prayer life. We want you to invest in your personal walk with each other around the Lord Jesus, committing to worship and life together around word and prayer. It's actually what you most need. It's what I most need. The riches of the gospel is actually the antidote to the life of fear, to the life of resentment, to the life of ungratefulness, and to the life of greed that so marks not just our culture, but has permeated the Christian life. May God help us do that. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come this morning in a spirit of repentance Because the spirit of the age has stirred up within us such discontentment that we think everything else will give us the comfort and the security and the power and the love we so long for in life. It has made us idolaters. It has made us ungrateful. It has made us demanding. And it has made us greedy. And so this morning we do repent. We repent because we are blind to the riches of the gospel. We're blind to what you have secured and given us today in the Lord Jesus. Open our eyes. We know we can't do it. By your Spirit, open our eyes so that we see not just the depth of our sin, but the breath of your riches, so that we might find ourselves more and more, more and more in love with Jesus, obsessed with Jesus, so that we might give ourselves to pursuing true godliness in the Lord Jesus, listening to Him, following Him, knowing Him, and loving Him so that He consumes the horizon of our lives, so that He becomes all sufficient for us and help us as a people, as a community, walk with each other in worship and life around the Lord Jesus. We ask this in His name. Amen.